Okay, so yesterday we left things in a bit of a bugger's muddle. Um, in fact, uh, uh, this vagrant file, we, we got these reloads in, and they're ugly, ugly, horrible mess. Uh, so I got rid of them. Uh, and I'm now trying to. Uh, 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 so the, the next thing I wanted to do. Well, I wanted to get rid of those uh, uh, reboot uh, reloads because they're, they're they're pointless if we can walk around them. <clears throat> so the reason for the reloads was mainly to uh, make sure that the changes we made to the host name uh, were properly implemented however it turns out there's a much better way of doing this first of all although these two lines were quite correct um, the first one sets in the hosts to make sure that we've got uh, the fully qualified domain name uh, uh, and the host name itself uh, correctly identified and this second one uh, is the one that sets the host name for the reboot uh, what was missing was the extra command to actually set the host name in real time but we can kill two birds with one stone oh kenny do you mind i don't really need a bath um, so we can kill two birds with one stone by getting rid of this here and because the uh, because debian is using uh, the system d uh, uh, um, What's the best way of explaining it? Uh, system D is a sort of startup and management uh, system. Uh, we'll, we'll go into some more details about it. There's been a lot of controversy <coughs> amongst certain groups uh, about the wisdom of System D. The reality is, uh, System D is coming a lot, or has come along. Uh, most uh, distributions, common distributions now use systemd. Uh, there are a few holdouts, but frankly, mm, it's pretty much de facto standard now. Anyway, uh, long story short, there's now this one command, hostname ctl, uh, which can be used to set the hostname, uh, and it will take care of not only setting the hostname. Uh, that's currently in use, but also set it so that uh, in the reboot that etc hostname file is, is set correctly, uh, along with uh, various other things. Uh, but for our purposes, uh, the good news is it, it solves our problem. Okay, so okay, so we put that in there. So now our bootstrap script uh, is now going to work. Uh, without the necess necessity to do a reload which means we can get rid of that line and we can get rid of that line uh, I'm going to leave this separate uh, because ultimately we are still going to need uh, different things running on uh, the master compared to running on the uh, all the minions okay uh, so we'll leave that there for now. Uh, so let's write out that vagrant file. And let's just make sure that. Oopsie daisy. Uh, right. Uh, let's just make sure that our vagrant is not running anything important. Uh, good. Nothing's running. So we can do a vagrant up which will bring up both servers and of course now we got the hurry up and wait <clears throat> okay well while we're doing that uh, let's take a look at uh, what we're going to do next uh, Let's do it. Wait, mate. Yeah, there's nothing for you. I'm just getting a pen. 
Okay, so what we've got, uh, yeah, you're really not helping doing that. <laughs> okay, so what we've got is um, uh, we've now got two machines. Okay, so we've got server one, uh, and we've got server two. This one is going to be our router slash, let's call it network services. Okay, and this one is going to be our general purpose server. Uh, so, what we want to do, uh, so th these two at the moment are connected. This one has got the salt master, and it's got a minion. And this one just has a minion. Okay, now obviously this minion is commuting uh, communicating with the salt master and it is using ultimately the local loop uh, uh, interface and this one is communicating uh, over that private network okay so it's communicating via uh, the communication central net okay which is which is the uh, virtual box interface okay and in actual fact on both these machines it will be ethernet one but we need to make sure of that because <clears throat> at the moment uh, the, the the salt processes salt master and salt minion are both going to connect to uh, all the interfaces so it'll be connected to the local loop ethernet one and in fact Ethernet Zero, which if you remember, uh, Ethernet Zero effectively is the outside world uh, via, uh, via the virtual box interface. Yeah. So it's, it's essentially on this system, Ethernet Zero, as far as we're concerned, on the server, this should only allow SSH traffic. Okay, and that allows uh, Vagrant to work on this machine, and again only under the Vagrant. Okay, we need to make sure that Ethernet Zero uh, uh, only allows SSH to allow Vagrant to work, uh, and allows outgoing traffic uh, to. The world wild west. Okay, it's actually to the local area network again. Remember it's bridged on our host Okay, but we, we need this router in order for it to work uh, like our finished product um, We need something that will allow connection to the outside world now At the moment we're going to assume that to be Ethernet zero but as we'll see uh, in actual fact ultimately we want this router to have in fact uh, one public interface uh, which will go out to the internet okay because on our real physical system yeah, the server and the router uh, exist on the LAN and then the router oh, let's do it uh, and the router has another interface, okay, which connects out to our modem, which in turn connects out to the internet. Right. Uh, and in actual fact, this second interface uh, only is only uh, uh, for us to get uh, traffic going out onto the internet. It's not used for anything else. Okay, uh, and this we call LAN one. Okay, and the router also will have uh, uh, a second interface, which is internal, uh, which will be connected to LAN two. Okay, and LAN two uh, will be our private or secured network. Um, but we'll get to that in a minute. <clears throat> 
the point being that traffic on land one and land two will be quite separate uh, so that uh, you don't get any bleed across between the two but both land one and land two need access out to the internet um, in this case land two will not connect directly to the internet it will connect via a vpn out to the internet whereas land one will be just raw go straight out onto the internet um, there's going to be a firewall uh, i'm pretty sure i've got a green bed in there uh, but i can't see it at the moment typical okay i'll do it in red as well so there's a firewall here okay uh, which will protect our LAN networks from the internet uh, there's actually also a firewall here which is on the modem uh, and each of these servers will have its own firewall okay uh, internally so you've got different types of firewall involved here you've got host firewalls which are these uh, and then you've got uh, device firewalls okay which is the, like the one on the modem the distinction it's a distinction without a difference as far as we're concerned though because uh, all of these firewalls are really just um, uh, implemented as uh, firewalls on Linux uh, servers uh, and we'll dive into that we're going to try using the more modern format okay uh, of uh, Linux firewalls now you will see a lot of stuff on the internet uh, about Linux firewalls uh, and you'll be very familiar with IP tables by the time we're done uh, because we need to talk about IP tables uh, mainly because it's probably the interface you're going to come across more than anything else uh, when we talk about firewalls but uh, IP tables now is actually just uh, a, a, a sort of thin uh, interface over uh, the more modern um, implementation of firewalls which is the uh, sort of uh, oh, I'm having a brain fart uh, it's it's the it's the net filters uh, implementation in the Linux kernel all right oh, and there's a whole series of net filters commands uh, and those net filter commands uh, are really the ones we ought to use in preference to IP tables but it's debatable it's a bit like IP4 and IP6 right? uh, you know really everyone should be moving to IP6 uh, but it's slow because there's such a legacy of IP4 and IP4 works for most things and I'm afraid the same sort of problem with IP tables and net filters everyone's used to uh, IP tables uh, and so as a consequence it, most of it is you know um, uh, uh, you know uh, most of the work we will see is on IP tables and when you look for work, uh, help on firewalls people will give that help in the in the shape of IP tables generally anyway uh, yeah sorry uh, back to back to our um, setup <clears throat> so on the, these two boxes this box will have uh, docker installed on it and uh, we're going to put a whole load of functions on there now because it's the local area network uh, in my house effectively uh, there's not uh, a huge load on this particular server so we can actually put quite a lot of stuff on it uh, because it's not going to do very much uh, so even though it's only a tiny box uh, it, it's, it's not going to be overloaded uh, on this box we're going to put all of the uh, sort of network functions so we will put um, uh, obviously all, all the routing that takes us through 
Yeah, we're going to put the firewall on there. We're also going to put a name server on here. Uh, and the name server primarily will be providing uh, all the fixed names within this network. Uh, and it will be providing um, a, a name service cache for whenever we access the internet. Uh, also on here we will put the DHCP server which will service all of the internal networks. So it'll be the DHCP server that services LAN 1 and LAN 2 for any machines and, and devices that are connected to it. But we will rely on the DHCP server of the modem to provide the IP address of this interface. Right. So that will give us a, an opportunity then to look at uh, how DHCP works um, and how you know it's perfectly reasonable to have a client that talks to different DHCP servers on different networks. Uh, what else are we going to put on here? Oh, we'll also put uh, some intrusion detection software uh, on the router, um, which will help again to protect against incoming uh, bad actors. Uh, what we won't put on here uh, at the moment is uh, ultimately we will put a VPN client for connecting out. Uh, but um, what we won't do is we won't talk about VPNing in at the moment, mainly because what we don't want to do is put holes in this firewall. Uh, what we're going to do is something a bit cunning. Uh, we will have out on the internet, we will have a VPN server and we will connect out from here to penetrate through the firewall to the VPN server. And then anyone who wants to talk to us will connect to the VPN server like that. So all the traffic will actually go through that VPN server into this network um, and we'll talk about the details of setting that up as and when. Uh, what else do we need to talk about? Well, well, we'll take it step by step. Okay, uh, right, so that's now running. Okay, so now if we SSH into uh, oops, SHH, honestly, what am I thinking? SH, there we go. So we are connecting uh, it through to our server one. Uh, and if we look at, oops, let's do um, salt key. So this is listing all the keys. And you can see that we've got the two unaccepted keys that we're expecting, server one and server two. Um, and this is where this second script uh, will come in. Uh, uh, if you remember, in the main script, uh, although it doesn't do anything at the moment, we will be uh, putting in there the control loop to accept these specific keys uh, during this startup process. But for now, if I just do salt key minus A, it will accept them all. And I will now be able to test the system to make sure everything's connected up. And there we go. So we've got our two minions. Okay, so these are the minions responding true. This test ping is not a ping like an ICMP. Uh, uh, ICMP ping. Uh, it, so it's not... Um, actually pinging as such what it's doing in, in, in the sense of in the same way as if we did you know ping uh, 1.254 to ping the other server okay so that's actually doing an icmp ping to the other server all right uh, but this is a uh, running a an, ex uh, an execution module on each of the server uh, on each of the minions okay it's running the test execution module and it's running the ping function within that execution module and all that does is confirm 
that yes, this minion is alive and running, uh, and it does that by returning true. Uh, so yes, so that's a nice, quick, easy way of making sure that a set of minions is actually up and running. Uh, you can see that the uh, I, I've used uh, backslash star. Why the backslash? Well, if you don't, then star is interpreted as being a file glob by the command line, uh, the shell, you know, the bash shell command line processor. So you have to backslash it in order to get the actual star. You can also put single quotes around it like that to prevent it from expanding. Okay, we could also do something like this. Uh, SRV star. That would work as well because it's wildcarding the, the beginning of the name. Yeah. I could also do uh, star dot land one. Okay, which would get me all the, all of the uh, minions on land one. Uh, I could do. Well, you get you get the idea. If I wanted to do a specific one. Uh, then I would do server one star. Okay, which just gets me server one. I still need the wildcard star because if I do server one, there is no minion called server one. Yeah. So I still need to put the star in there or put the whole name in. Yeah. Okay, so we've now got our functioning salt system. The problem is we've got no salt configuration at all. So the next job uh, is to start thinking about how we, well, uh, we, no, let's, let's finish what we were doing first. Let's finish what we we're doing first. So we want to look at this uh, main utility to figure out exactly um, how uh, it's going to work. So what we want it to do is we want it to go into a steady loop and in that steady loop it will be doing two jobs. Okay, First of all it will be looking to accept a certain list of keys. Now the second job it's going to do is that each time it accepts a key it needs to look at the accept uh, the list of accepted keys, and if they meet certain criteria, it will then run um, the orchestration step appropriate to those servers. Now, what do I mean? Right. Um, okay. Let's uh, let's go back over here. Right. No point in being a paper waster. Okay, so if I've got uh, just two servers, it's a fairly simple job. Okay, so we've got server one and server two. Okay, so it could be that I could run a certain set of configuration as soon as I see server one. So let's say, uh, okay, let's say server one needs Docker installed. Okay, I could install Docker like that uh, as soon as I see server one accepted. In fact, as soon as I see server two accepted, I can install Docker there. And it doesn't matter, these two are completely independent of one another. Yeah, I can install these Dockers completely independent. However, what I can't do is I can't, for example, configure server one to say, okay, the name server that server one should refer to is on server two. Okay, I can't do that as soon as I see server one's minion up and running. If I do, I'm going to break server one. So everything I do subsequently, uh, if it needs to refer to, for example, um, yeah, Docker IO to get Docker uh, itself, or, or 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 indeed any of the package repositories. Okay. It would break because it would say, "Well, I admit the name server I need is on server two, and server two is not up and running yet." So this is where orchestration comes in. Okay, orchestration says, "Okay, only when 
both of these things are available, run the orchestrator, which says, right, first of all, before I set the name server on server one, I have to install the name server service, okay, on server two. And only when I've done that step can I then come back here and tell this thing to use this as the name server. Am I clear? Yeah, so you can see there's a dependency, yeah? and the dependency is between these two machines. Okay, I can't do a certain step on server one until server two is ready. Okay, and as soon as server two, server two is ready, I can then run it on server one. Yeah? So, uh, and if I've got you know ten servers that are all referring to this thing as the name server, then all ten of these have to wait until this name service has been installed on server two. Uh, all right. Uh, yeah, so there's, there's that. Uh, and it can become even more complicated. So let's say we've got uh, three servers, one of which is going to be our web server, one of which is our application server, and one of which is our database server. Okay, you can see the dependencies here. Okay, so the coupling is going to be, I don't want to install uh, the app server and try and start it up until I've got the database server. Okay, so this has to be the first thing to be done. This has to be the second thing to be done, and this has to be the third thing to be done. But if I don't know when these three servers are going to be appearing, uh, how quickly they're going to appear on my on my system, then I need some way of orchestrating between the three. Hmm? Okay, so that's what we're going to be doing next. Uh, so step one. Uh, is to have this uh, main script look out for uh, a list of expected uh, minions. So, uh, now, each of the minions is installed in the same basic way. Okay, and the data we provide is uh, the host name, uh, the rest of the fully qualified domain name, and its IP address. Uh, well, actually, it's the IP, that, that's the IP address of the master, so we don't need to worry about that. Uh, but we do need the IP address of the machine itself. Okay, so there are three pieces of information that definitely need to be stored. Now you recall we looked yesterday at one I did uh, a while back where we'd done very much the same sort of thing. You know, we'd set up a data structure to describe what each of the machines was. Uh, now by doing that, not only can we simplify our file uh, in, in terms of what gets run into it, uh, so we really only need uh, two things. You know, we, we need one thing to install these two commands uh, and then we need the master to have special a special rule. Uh, but in terms of actually configuring it, we need these two things to run on every single server. Uh, so e all the data that we're providing uh, can be abstracted out to a data structure. Okay, now that data structure can also be used to provide the parameters that get passed into this main function. Okay, specifically, we need to give it the uh, names of uh, the list of servers. Okay, and potentially the list of servers against the orchestration that needs to be run on those servers. Mm. Mm. Okay, well we don't want to go too far with this. So, I'm beginning to think if we're going to go down that road, we probably want to read in that data from a data from a file rather than create it in here. The reason being that we can then just have main read the same file. Uh, because all the, all, the, all the information will be in that single configuration file, which means uh, having this uh, read in 
some kind of configuration description. Now we could do it in JSON. Uh, let's have a look at uh, Ruby. Let's read a, since we're going to be dealing with YAML. Uh, how do I parse a YAML file in Ruby? What a good question. Uh, there we go, in your sample YAML. Uh, so we require YAML uh, and then we load that file. Uh, uh, well, that looks promising. What was that confusion? Oh my word. Uh. Oh, wow. Looks like they were making that horribly complicated. Okay, so uh, again, this is just uh, this is just a, a Ruby file. So let's try. Uh, let's just put require uh, YAML. Let's up and hope <clears throat> it's one of the standard libraries. Uh, we can tell quick enough when um, we go over to here. Uh, vagrant. I think. How do we just verify the vagrant file? I think that will do it actually. Uh, validate. There we go. That's all I need. Uh, just to make sure we don't get an error. That's good. Okay. Uh, and now we will put the, uh, uh, if I remember correctly, we created a provisioner that was just called common, didn't we? Uh, no, master minion and some server was basically the common, wasn't it? So if we put a file into server uh, called uh, let's call it server dot yaml. Okay, and then down here we do um uh, what was it? Oh, sorry, uh, let's call it, let's say servers is equal to yaml dot load file uh, quotes and it's going to be provisioners slash server slash server this is all very experimental isn't it uh, we need to confirm that that file exists this may very well throw an error if it's not there. Okay, let's uh, again hashtag not a Ruby programmer. Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. All right. Okay. So let's just validate that again. Make sure we're not getting any error. Cool. Okay, uh, I'm going to do validate and provision. Okay, uh, what was it complaining about? Uh, oh, 
That's okay. Stupidity is what it's complaining about. Mm -hmm. Now then, to read, yeah, the difficulty is, because I've decided to use YAML, I'm going to need uh, some way within Bash to read that YAML. Now, I know there's a utility JQ, but what, uh, but there is actually a YQ, which is a wrapper around yaml to json and then you can call jq from there um i'm just questioning the wisdom of doing it this way because it will require the user of this to have uh, yaml to json and jq installed if i just have server.json that would simplify things somewhat because I could just have JQ, even though server the server.json file, yeah, JSON is just horrible to read. Uh, I suppose it might be a better way of doing it. Uh, And that means that you only have to have JQ installed. Uh, having said that, ah, no, we have to have JQ installed on the host. So that's actually got quite good because we can make main check and install JQ. Ooh, actually, that yeah, that's pretty good. Okay. Yes. Okay, so so the uh, yeah. Okay, first of all, we should put server configuration file on master because it's only really needed on the master. Okay, so we want to move the provisioner server server YAML to provisioner's master. Server servers and we'll do it with JSON. Now I'm assuming, somewhat optimistically I suppose, that it's as simple as uh, something like this. Uh, it, it might be lowercase, I guess. Uh, and the reason for moving into master is uh, this thing is already copying the contents of master it's chill modding it to plus x but nobody cares about that mm. okay let's see whether that actually works uh, vagrant. Ah, oh, arse. Okay, well, that's, not, that's not, not a big deal. That's just me not knowing about Ruby Jason. Uh, da -da -da -da. Uh, okay, so you've got Jason Pars. And reading JSON from a file. Um, really? There isn't a single step to do it? I find that hard to believe. Um, but this is saying the same thing. Uh, 
Okay, so we need to actually do it in a slightly more roundabout way. That's okay. So we need. So that is it to json.pars and in brackets servers file uh, and servers file is equal to file.read um pa dum pa dum Okay. Mm, no such file or directory prisoners must serve adjacent. Really? A small point. <laughs> okay, so let's do um, leaflet and upload in business master service.json and uh, right. Right, so what we will do is key each server with its host name, and within that, uh, oh blimey, here we go. Uh, right, within that, we will put all the information that we need uh, um, right. uh, so the information we need is oops, IP address to dot one six eight dot one dot two five three Salt, let's just say salt ops. 
uh, in actual fact, we only need a setting for uh, in the master, but we'll put it in here just to be safe. Um, uh, what else do we need? Uh, oh, uh, yes, we need the master's IP address. Now, okay. Uh, now, admittedly, this is a bit of an overkill for because uh, uh, most of this is the same, but it will become apparent when we start doing the more sophisticated stuff why we do it like this. Uh, okay. So let's now make sure that that does something sensible. Boom, what have we got? Unexpected token at. Uh, uh, do I have to put, is it? Is it not colons? You have to put those weird arrow things in. Oh, blimey, here we go. Shows how often I use JSON. That one, that's JSON introduction. Uh, that'll do. Blah, blah, blah. blah. Yeah, uses colons. Mm. Mm. So what was the unexpected token? Pause error, 767, unexpected token at, and then not being especially helpful, Uh, oh, that's garbage, come on. But, uh, okay, that was not helpful. Mm -hmm. Let's see if there's anything more useful. Right. Mm -hmm. Remember Okay. Nothing especially wrong in there, so uh, it can have white space in it. Oh, I'm going to do it. Well, I've got two quotes there. Uh -huh. okay. Boom. Right, so we've got the beginnings of it. Now we need to just correct this. Uh, Now the tricky part is going to be what to do about this bit here that runs main.
Uh, because I mean, most of it's fairly straightforward, isn't it? And I'm going to I'm going to just steal it more or less verbatim from uh, documents. Oh, come on, give me a break. Uh, right, I'm going to steal it more or less verbatim from here. Okay, because what we're going to get in is something very similar to this. Uh, which we can then say for uh, service and for each of those servers to get its name. It's actually yeah, it's the same name and its configuration. Uh, uh, and it's just going to be uh, it's going to be the name Ah, now then. Uh, uh, let's deal with that problem later. See, it does a whole load of stuff in here. Uh, uh, actually, we'll, uh, yeah, let's take these four lines because we may want to vary the. So this just this just allows us to specify memory and CPUs as part of our setup, uh, and if they're not if they're not specified, then it just skips over this. Uh, right here we go. Uh, that's probably a useful line to have, even though strictly speaking, not necessary. Uh, Ah, now here it's setting the host name to be the fully qualified domain name uh, rather than just the name. So we need to uh, uh, so we're just going to specify that to be name. Uh, Uh, they're all based on the Debian box at the moment. Uh, in, in actual fact, these uh, we, we can specify default values for a lot of these things uh, by just specifying the general configuration like we have done here. 
Uh, so that uh, it, that config effectively becomes the default, uh, and this just becomes the exceptions to that default. Uh, and that is true uh, with here as well with this with this memory stuff. So we'll sort that out in a minute. Uh, right. Um, I'm going to take the whole of that and we're going to put that in there. And we're going to remove this line and we're going to have to change the way this thing's laid out slightly. Okay, because if you look at this, it's got a separate section uh, for the NICs. Oops, so uh, let's uh, uh, it's of three. Uh, so instead of uh, putting everything in one place, uh, right. So where we've just got an IP address here, uh, the, the Nix approach lets us be a bit more subtle. So we can say Nix. And we can define multiple network interface cards, which will be useful later. Uh, and if we've got the IP address, the adapter to use, uh, which we will set to two. And virtual box internal network which we will set to uh, so we will take these four or five lines. And replicate them into there, and then take that and okay. Okay, there's a lot of rep repetition here. Here, at the moment. we may find that uh, if we do an awful lot of these boxes, uh, we'll probably want to do some work on defaults. Uh, uh right so um yeah uh yeah mm, uh, mm, let's think about that uh, uh port forwarding we will uh not worry about port forwarding at the moment okay what's the other thing the other stuff is data which is going to be passed through. So um, uh, that's the bootstrap stuff. Right, so now uh, Now we're going to specify here, and each of these arguments is going to become 
a value. So this becomes um, name. This becomes uh, domain. This becomes oops. Um, this becomes the master IP uh, and this becomes oh, oh of course we've got to put it all in nconf uh, yeah, it's, not, it's not as simple as that is it it's it's nconf uh, and it's mm, stopped options. And begs the question We haven't dealt with the problem of these two extra steps. Uh, now I've got a kludgy way of doing it. Get rid of that. Uh, the kludgy way of doing it is just to say uh, if name is server one, then provision those two extra files. Okay, let's just do it that way for now. Oh, long. See, this is how weak my room is. Uh, oh, sorry, Ruby condition. Uh, I think simply enough, it's just the standard if then format. I can live with that. Uh, what shall we do? Uh, so that's the bootstrap script. So we, we've got rid of that. That's the bootstrap script. So that's just these two lines, isn't it? Uh, so if n conf um, if name uh, now is it a single equals or a double equals? Um, what's Ruby's equality comparison? Triple equals. Alright, okay, fine. I, I would guess triple equals means the same object, but oh. if name equals uh, SLV 001, uh, then uh, we do those two lines. Uh, the difference being, of course, that that will be called node. Mm -hmm. Let's just check. Yeah. 
Yeah, I thought so. Object one is equal to object two. Uh, yeah, so the two equal signs is just the standard equality, whereas triple equals is is it the same object? Yeah, I had a feeling that was the case. Uh, right. Uh, so we'll just do two equal signs in there because we don't. Right, it's never going to be the same object. I mean, it's going to be the same object type. So name equals server one, then you run those two extra steps, which is a bit. Uh, I'm not greatly impressed by that, but uh, it's good enough. I suppose it's no worse than what we've done with memory. Uh, and on that note, uh, let's get rid of that. Okay, so we've made our vagrant file look more complicated, but I think it's actually simpler in many respects. It certainly does a lot more uh, in many respects. So we've got to still deal with the issue of primary and how do we... Uh, uh, let, let's see... Uh, Ruby variable expansions uh, string substitution, good enough. Uh, yes, yes, yes. But we can do it like that. So string interpolation. Dun, dun, dun. Okay, so string interpolation is exactly what I want. Uh, that link is decidedly not working very well. So maybe string interpolation. Uh, Right. Can I define a default value for it? Uh, it looks like you can put any code you like in there, so maybe it's as simple as putting an OR. Uh, so we just want a Try it. Uh, blah, blah, blah. So uh, the interface uh, so we, we just check my face for uh, no, 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 not the interface you form. Uh, I don't want that. Wait a minute. Why have I got a node outside there? Uh. sense. Um, so if that key exists, okay, so what I want to do is here, I want to say if uh, in, uh, interface Well, um, 
Schlimm da. No, 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 I don't need to do what. That's the nonsense. All I need to do is, seriously, I'm having a complete brain fart today. Mm. All I need is to take that and add it into here. No, 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 because it's not. Uh, come on, Mark. Engage brain. Uh, I do need to. It's this primary, isn't it? Uh, this is what's making the difference. So. Can I do that all in one? Uh, uh, does Ruby have a terminal operator? Looks like it. Yes, it does. Nice. So we can actually do it all in one go by saying uh, uh, and we can say If and conf key uh, uh, primary uh, ba -ba 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 key. Something up. Uh, uh, I'm close. Something off that needs to be closed off. So uh, da, 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 da. that's the do loop. That's the do loop. That's the if if end of uh, two ends for the loop and for the do. Syntax error in the following very syntax error. Uh, okay. The, oh, wait a minute. Do, do loop for the config. That's the virtual file. That's the do loop for the next. That's the end for the if. That's the end for the if. Hang on a minute. That looks like it's missing a an end. Dun, dun, dun. Right, unexpected token. Cool. Well, at least we're getting somewhere, uh, and that's. Probably cause uh, it doesn't take true. 
There's any boolean. Interesting. So does it does it take um, Okay, so what we're looking for is JSON Boolean. So that can't be the problem. What's it getting all pissy about? Unexpected token at. Uh, Twenty five three. Right. It implies that that true it's not it's no good. And yet up here it shows it's got uh, true and false are maybe. If it needs to be in quotes. And, oh, I mean that's, that looks okay. Uh, and that's all we've got over here. That's just, that's, why is that wrong? Uh, let's see if uh, um, uh, yeah, filter and files. Okay. Thank uh, you. Dot versions master. Uh, Comma, expecting end. Mm. Unexpected comma. Really? <laughs> All right, let's try this. Mm, no, wrong. Let's just put that in quotes for a second. Not as much. Oh, well, that was fucking stupid, wasn't it? Dot. There we go. Mm, here we go. Colon. Not as part of an object at line four. Uh. Oh. <laughs> Okay. 
Right. Right, uh, line 12. Uh. Right, so undefined method each. I did wonder why there was a dollar in that. Why is there a, do why is there a dollar in that? Look, there's a dollar in this VM list, but why? Oh, I did find it. It's dollar VM. List. I did. I did only find it as dollar VM list. That's weird. Oh. Cool. Interesting. Why is it doing server 2 then server 1? Because that's the way destroy works. It works in reverse order. Okay, that's cool. Uh, yeah. Destroy works in reverse order on the basis that you want to take machines down in the opposite way that you've constructed them. So, let's see if this works. So far, so good. Oh, it's nice to have data driven stuff in it. I can tell you're impressed. Well, so, there's a lot of belly rubbing going on. Mm -hmm. Is there not enough belly rubbing for you? All right. Uh, what was all this leading to? <laughs> I remember there was a reason why I did this. What did I do this in the first place? Well, first of all, to get the data structure started. Because uh, there's more I want to do with this, isn't there? Uh, I suppose actually we could have the supplementary scripts, like the master one. Uh, 
actually in their own area. That's probably a, that's probably neater, all things considered. Right. And then we just run them in the order that they appear. That's actually not a bad idea, Kenny. Good fella. Mm -hmm. Good fella. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I think, I'll, yeah, I like that idea. I prefer it to having that cludge in there. So the idea would be, um, well, leave this to run. Okay, so there's, uh, there's that. Uh, let me move on to main. Oh yes, we wanted to be able to read this in as part of main. So main, the first thing main needs to do is it needs to make sure that the JQ tool is installed. JQ is actually handy to have lying around anyway because it, it does the nice pretty printing of JSON output which will be uh, uh, the stepping stone to um, uh, we, we can get JSON output from salt so we can put that straight through JQ to do interesting stuff with it so uh, it's not a bad tool to have laying around anyway uh, <clears throat> uh, at least laying around on the master so we can install that um, and then uh, we can use JQ to select certain items from uh, yeah within bash we can use JQ to select certain items from within uh, the server's definition file. Uh, the main thing we want are the fully qualified, well, the, the minion names, which we know are going to be for each entry, it's going to be its host name plus its fully qualified domain name. That's going to be uh, its mean ID. Uh, So we can use that to do the acceptance. And I'm now beginning to think we're probably going to need something a bit more serious to do this. We might have to write a Python script. Main might have to become a Python script because the whole orchestration bit needs more thinking out. Um, and if we're going to go down that road, then I'm starting to think if you're going to do Python, then you could actually integrate this with salt directly. So is there a salt key API? Uh, so salt stack, uh, salt key. Uh, <coughs> Okay, uh, what I want to know is, can I get this straight from, uh, I'm probably, here we go, developing salt. Uh, um, Mm -hmm. Okay, probably going to need to do a bit of homework. 
And I think we can probably load the salt key. Uh, we could probably load the module for doing the salt key acceptance directly in the salt, which we know is going to be installed. Which will mean not having to mess around with the command line interface. Uh, right, okay, so it looks like. Okay, let's. Uh, Let's just check the host name. Uh, and let's fully qualify domain name. Ah, right. Uh, that hasn't worked. Mm, Uh, so the nconf domain wasn't there. The name name worked. Did we get the nicks? Uh, hmm. No. Right. So basically. It didn't work at all the way I expected. Right, so nconf is going to be what? It's going to be an object. Uh, which has Nix. Horrible feeling occurs. For each server, um, should be the same thing, shouldn't it? Okay, let's just make sure that we're getting the right thing. So, so there's a pretty print library. So we do uh, uh, oh, where are we? Uh, we require PP and then we just PP the object. Okay. In fact, we should get that out when we do a validate. Okay, so we get server and then an object, uh, nix, an array. So why? Uh, okay, so I mean, it looks like we're getting the right thing out. Um, we're actually getting the name right. Uh, presumably, we're also getting the primary out, right? Uh, because that came up no problem, didn't it? 
it says that it might just be getting the first one. Um, don't care about those at the moment. The host name was obviously getting out of the name. But we didn't seem to be getting any nicks. Uh, so let's take this one step at a time. Pretty print and conf. Okay. Uh, so that's the end conf seems to be okay. Uh, so let's pretty print. Sure, if you're a Ruby program, you're probably screaming that oh, I've done something really obvious. Ah, now then, why, why is there no nicks? I mean, there is a key, but the key is not the symbols nicks. Is it that simple? Is it that it's expecting Wow Does it oops does it not accept I mean, that's good in a way. <laughs> mm. <sighs> so, vagrant validate. So, that's what the mix looks like. Uh, and for each entry in Nix, we are setting up load VM, da, 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 comma, the interface, which is that lot. Uh, Uh, uh. Don't tell me it doesn't accept strings.
So it's getting the object past us itself, but isn't that exactly what happens? Right. Mm. Okay, so there are some differences on the one hand, we are dealing with string indexes and on the other hand we're dealing with symbol indexes but so that really cause a problem mm. Mm. Why is that causing a problem? Okay. Right. Is something simpler? Should be true. Interesting that it's output twice. Uh, is that because it looped around twice? In which case. Why did we only get the error on the second thing round? Um.
Okay, so at least we know that the keys... Now oh, that's going to be a problem, isn't it, Keith? If the configuration is expecting those to be symbols and not strings... Excellent. That's exactly what we need. That is exactly what we need. It's going to break the stuff I've just fixed. Wow, a winner, Run a winner, winner, chicken dinner. Okay, so all that stuff I just changed needs to be set back uh, to symbols. That was lovely. Uh, and this primary stuff needs to be changed back. Uh, and I believe that, that should do the job. Get true and false out. Boom. Jobs are good. Alright. Okay. Well, that was uh, a bit more painful than it needed to be, but on the whole, not too shabby. So let's see if that fixes our problem. Uh, let's get rid of. 
Uh, let's get rid of that. Um, redo all the machines again, and hopefully this time we'll get all the interfaces we want. So, back to my So, I'm assuming that this Or I care about the syntax of logical or. It's got to be the most confused way. Uh, I've ever seen of illustrating this. What, what psychopath wrote that? It's got to be the most confusing thing I've ever seen. Right, I don't even know about really operators. I know. Da, 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 da. Uh, Simon, no. Uh, right, turn the operators. The logical operators. Okay. Uh, oh, for crying out loud. They're, they're comparators. Uh, God. Ah, right. Okay. That that looked promising. That looked promising. Right. And is the same and but with lower precedence. Okay. They both do short circuit evaluation. Fine. That was all I wanted to know. Right, okay, so all the short circuit evaluation. The question is, what is the value? Is it the last thing evaluated? Or is it just the Boolean value? Uh, Uh, 
Using ternary health and stick with the ternary operator seems to be the answer, but uh, right, well, this seems to be doing an awful lot of stuff. Are you getting hungry, young man? Is that what the fidgets are for? Yes, I know it's dinner time. Although you're going to have to wait to go out because it is far too hot outside. I'm not leaving my lovely air conditioning to take you for a walk. Besides which, you don't like it when it's hot. <laughs> what are you wagging your tail for? Do you want to come up? Come on. You coming up? Do you want to... I think, I think you just want to be fed, don't you? Ah, come on. Wait, well, you're sitting right in the way now. Come on. Come here. We'll finish this experiment and then uh, we'll, we'll take a break to feed you. Hey, we've got our extra interface, which is really the only thing. Uh, let's just uh, and we've got salt injected, which means it must have set that salt master. And the only other thing to check is uh, host name. Good. And you're really not helping, you know. Look at that. Okay, so we're good to go again. And on that note, we will destroy those machines. Because we don't need them anymore. And we'll take a break for a couple of minutes while I feed you. Okay. Uh,